All right. Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to Comp 3350 Software Engineering. Today, we are going to uh, continue preparing some technical planning artifacts. So the first technical planning artifact that we created last class was our release plan. The release plan is, is the least technical technical planning artifact in that it's not really technical. We don't write code to make this artifact. It's more that it's not our clients, it's not our users creating this document. So the fact that it's somebody on our team, our project manager or us that's making this specific artifact, the release plan, that's what's making it a technical planning artifact. We're going to be looking at a couple of technical planning artifacts today that are actually technical. They are either going to involve code, designing or thinking about how you're going to organize code, or listing out the kinds of tasks that you as a developer are going to need to do to accomplish the goal that you have, that you set up in your, in your vision. The other thing that we're going to start looking at today is, uh, is version control. So you are all using GitLab right now, but you're not necessarily using it as a version control tool. You're primarily using it as a project management tool, a way to keep track of the stuff that you need to do for this project. GitLab and Git are version control software tools, and you're going to be using this extensively throughout the term to work with your team. So we're going to be spending some time today thinking about how we're going to use that. So uh, first things first, I just want to quickly take this whirlwind tour of our N-tier architecture to kind of remind you of where we were at last class. And uh, just to give you a sense of, of what we're looking at in terms of building up an architectural diagram. So there are a bunch of different kinds of software architectures that are used frequently in software development but we're focusing specifically on one architecture. And that architecture that we're focusing on is the N-tier architecture. The idea of N-tier architectures are that we're separating our code logically into layers or tiers, and each tier has a single responsibility, so a single kind of responsibility. We are going to be designing something that is a three-tier architecture that matches this diagram fairly well. So the presentation tier, this is going to be where all of your Android-specific code is going. If you were building something with iOS, this would be where all of your iOS-specific code would be going. If you're building something on the desktop, this is where all of your desktop-specific stuff would be going. So either like Java Swing, or if you're doing something with, on the command line, this is where all your command line stuff would be going. Printf and scanf, that's where all that stuff would be going, is in the presentation tier of this, uh, of this architecture. The logic tier is basically the stuff that makes your product do what it says it's going to do. This is the code that makes your product your product. The data tier is going to be the, it's, this is also called the persistence tier, and I'm, I'm probably going to call it the persistence tier because that's just what my mind wants to call that uh, based on my experience. The data tier and the persistence tier is where all of the code related to taking the data that you've created or the data that you're working with and putting that into a database. So persisting that into a database and, and sticking it in the back end. The primary reason for doing this, or for separating our code out and organizing it this way, is for reusability. The theory of this is that I should be able to rip off the Android presentation layer and replace it with some other presentation layer and not have to change any of this stuff. The theory is I should be able to build a persistence layer that doesn't persist anything, so it's just a pretend thing that you're working with at the beginning, and you should be able to replace it with an actual SQL database without having to change your logic or your presentation layers. You will do this in practice in this course. 
the persistence layer that you're going to start with in iteration one is going to be non-persistent. It's not going to persist anything. It's just going to be like an in-memory storage system. You'll be using like HashMap or ArrayList or something to keep track of your object. And then moving into iteration two, you're going to rip that backend off and replace it with a SQL-based persistence thing, a real relational database. And the idea is you won't have to change your logic tier and you won't have to change your presentation tier to be able to do that. The diagram that I showed you doesn't really include the idea of the data model. The data model is the object set, the class set that you're creating that represents all of the things that are in your system. So the type of user accounts that you might have, the quizzes, the workouts, the recipes, the ingredients, all of those kinds of things that you have in your system. The data model is something that's going to be used across all of those tiers, and it's going to be what passes through the interfaces between those different layers. So you'll have an interface between the presentation and logic tier, and what you're passing between those are instances of your data model. You'll have an interface between the logic and the persistence layer, and you're passing instances of your data model in between those, uh, in between those two layers. The tiers are going to be communicating with method calls. So you'll have an interface that's defined as part of your logic layer, and you're going to be calling methods in the logic layer from your presentation layer. And likewise, your, present, your logic layer is going to call methods in your persistence layer. We're using Java. And the best way to organize the structure is to start using this package idea. So actually use the uh, packages feature that comes with the Java programming language to organize uh, the architecture that you've got. If you are doing something like this in like C or C++, you would use a folder structure or you would start to use the namespaces feature in C++ to do something like this. So what I want to quickly do before I get into uh, into this is I want to draw an architecture diagram that you can use as a basis for creating your own architecture diagram. I'm going to draw my architecture diagram kind of sideways compared to that one. That one was like layers on top of layers, and I want to do it uh, horizontally. So I want to have layers beside layers um, instead of vertically. The way that I think about an architecture diagram is that we've got this section that's going to span across all of the different layers of the application, and this will be our data model layer. So these are going to be all the classes that are related to all the classes that are related to my domain problem. So like quizzes and workouts and ingredients, that sort of idea. Beneath this, I'm going to have three separate layers. I'm going to have presentations here. I'm going to have logic. And I'm going to have persistence. In the presentation layer, is that what? No, that's not what it looks like at all. This is where all of our Android specific code is going to go. So in this layer, in the presentation layer of your code, this is, this is the only place in your code base where it's going to be OK to have import com.google or com.android or whatever. That's the only place where it's going to be OK to do that. In the logic layer, I'm going to have the code that makes my app my app. The code that encodes. the rules and operations that I have for my system.
And in the persistence and data layer, this is where I'm going to have a relational database. like a hash map. Similar to the presentation layer being the only place where you're going to have import com.android or whatever, this is the only place where it's OK to have SQL statements and SQL queries. This is the only place where you're going to do in inserts into tables. This is the only place where you're going to have selects from tables. Inserts and selects do not belong in the logic layer. Inserts and selects don't belong in the presentation layer. Inserts and selects do not belong in my data model. They only live in this persistence layer. That's the only place where they're going to go. I'm going to leave this up. And what I want you to do is either, either this is your choice now, take the list of class names that I have here for Notflix. And based on these class names, decide where in the architecture diagram they belong. Or alternatively, just start naming classes for your own project. Start planning the things out. Start coming up with the names of the domain model objects that you want to use. Start thinking about how you're going to do presentations. So what kind of classes might you want to have for presentation? Think about which things you're going to be persisting and which things you're going to be uh, using as kind of a logic layer. I've got another option for you. The options that you have for creating this diagram right now are to take your vision statement here. It's pretty full on the front side, but we are going to, uh, we're going to keep using the same piece of paper. Here's a trick. Fold this over, and then you can stick it backwards on the wall and you can start drawing on the back and draw your architecture diagram there. If you're going to use the architecture diagram on here, I would suggest that you also use sticky notes so you can quickly remove and replace if you want to move a class somewhere else. Or alternatively, you can use uh, Mermaid to create an architecture diagram. Uh, let me just quickly open this. GitLab can render uh, Mermaid diagrams in readme files. What I would suggest that you do if you are going to do this, this is from my 2150 class. We're doing this, I don't know why I picked this really terrible example of this bank account thing. It's really lame and boring. It's really, really lame and boring. And so I've decided today that uh, we're going to start making a Pokemon thing. And I brought my Game Boy, and I'm going to like turn on my Game Boy and like. I'm going to play it in class for a little while. Uh, this is a game that I was playing with my son. So let me tell you about the Pokemon that we have. This is super on topic, I know. We have a Butterfree that's named Zenka. I don't know why it's called Zenka. We have a, uh, a Bulbasaur that's named Good. We have a Rattata that's named Ratataz with a Z on the end. We've got a Nidoran that's just named Nidoran. And then we've got a Pidgey that's named Ramit. The mind of a, of a five-year-old. OK, anyway, uh, so if you do choose to use Mermaid, I would suggest that you pop open the docs here and uh, take a look at the sequence diagram. This is the one that's going to best kind of represent the structure that I'm asking you to represent with an architecture diagram. And what this is showing is two, two objects in this example and the relationship between them in terms of the method calls and the order of method calls that they're making. But you can abuse this format to create something that looks like what I'm describing with my architecture diagram. So how you do this is entirely up to you. I'm going to put this to the side. I'm going to have both of these things open at the same time. I'm going to give you uh, about 10 minutes to work on this, maybe a little bit less. And then we'll get all back together, and we'll keep moving on with some more uh, technical landing artifacts. So please go ahead.
Oh, um, just can you all hold on for a second? If, if you do not have access to GitLab, if anyone in your team doesn't have access to GitLab for some reason, please let me know before you leave today so that I that we're all connected to GitLab, okay? If, if everything's good, great. I'm just going on. You're okay. Uh, but if somebody doesn't have access, please come and talk to me, okay? All right. So uh, what I'm going to say about this, I think this is going okay. The exercise that I'm asking you to do here is basically think about the data model that you have. And what I would suggest that you do, so I'll have to let you do the rest of this architecture diagramming on your own time with your team, but as you're building up this architecture diagram, the pattern that I would suggest that you follow is come up with your data model. The data model is, it's everywhere. It's in every single layer of this architecture. So the data model is going to be the primary thing that you should be focusing on. Once you have a data model, then start to make corresponding class names for that data model. So let me give you an example here. In this Notflix, I have a video class. This is the name of one of the things in my domain model. It's, I've got videos in my domain model. I'm going to put video in my domain model here at the top. And then in the presentation layer, I don't have it here, but in the presentation layer, I might have something like video view. So this is going to be my Android class for viewing videos. In my logic class, I'll have a video manager. So I take video manager here, and I'd stick that into the logic layer. And then video storage, this is going to be what I'm going to put into my persistence layer. This architecture diagram, this is a good way to get you started thinking about the kinds of classes that you need to make for what you're doing. But it's got to be a living document. So this is something that you should be making changes to as you're changing your code. Because you're going to eventually realize, oh, this approach was not great. It didn't work for us, so I need to delete this class that I have for managing this one thing and replace it with something else. I like mermaid diagrams for what it's worth. I'm not suggesting that you use this, but I like mermaid diagrams for this purpose because they're plain text. And version control that we're going to see later works a lot better on plain text than it does on like a PDF or something that you're drawing on. So that's my, that's my personal preference there. I'm not saying you have to use this, but it makes it a little bit easier to do um, managing with version control. OK, so let's move on here. At this point, we've agreed on what we're going to build. We've got that high-level planning overview. We've created epics and features. We've got user stories. We've thought about when we're going to build it. We started creating release plans for the iterations that we're going to do. We started organizing user stories into iteration one. We started organizing features and epics across the rest of the releases that we're planning on doing. We've even started thinking about how we're going to organize it. So we're starting to think about the classes that we're going to have in our domain model, and we're starting to organize which package we're going to put that code into when we start to write the code. But when do we start actually writing code? All we've been doing is drawing pictures and writing stuff down and thinking about you know, when to do things and, and how to do it. How do we start writing code? I've given you the opportunity to think about class names now, but thinking about class names still leaves a lot to be desired in terms of you know, actually sitting down and striking keys on your keyboard. The first step to writing code is to, uh, it's just to write down some more stuff. It's to start planning a little bit more. 
The goal here is uh, we're going to come up with technical developer tasks. A developer task is a description of the coding tasks, the things that you, so now you can actually put your own hats back on and think about yourselves as a developer, the things that you personally need to do to be able to build the user story. So we're starting to think about technical things like which classes do I need to create? Which classes do I need to create in which layers? What do I personally need to learn how to do before I can start coding this thing up? In the developer tasks, we're going to be estimating time in hours. So user stories, we've been estimating in days. Epics and features, we were estimating in days or weeks. Now we're starting to think about granular estimation. So we're thinking about hours. The number of hours that are in each of these tasks should be less than one business day. So I am going to enforce upon you that a business day is seven and a half hours. That's how much time a business day is. The developer tasks that you come up with individually should be less than seven and a half hours. The process goes like this. As a team of people, you're going to sit down, you're going to pick a user story, you're going to look at it, and you're going to think about the kinds of things that you need to do. You're going to come up with an estimate for how long you think it's going to take, and then you're going to take the estimates that you have for all of the user stories that you've put into a release, uh, a release and add them all up again. So what do you need to do? This is the brainstorming part. What do you need to do to build this story? The things that you should be thinking about when you're looking at building a user story are, what kind of classes do I need to create? So what classes are going to represent this? What data model is involved in this? What data model exists in my code already? So what has been created? What do I still need to create? How do I need to change the data model that exists if there is something there? What changes do I need to make to the database itself? We're not at this point yet, but when we get to the point of using a real relational database, if you make changes to your data model, you have to make the corresponding changes to your relational database model, to your, uh, to your DDL, to your data definition language, to your create table statements. You have to make changes to your tables. If you make changes to the relationships that you have between classes in your system, you'll have to make changes to the corresponding tables so that you are representing those relationships. You are going to have to think about how long this is going to take for you to do it. You should make an estimate based on what you know. I don't know how to make an Android UI. I don't know. It's going to take me probably two hours just to figure out how to do that. Maybe I'm optimistic and I'm going to say it's going to take exactly one hour for me to figure out how to make a new screen in an Android app. Based on what you know, as you get further along in the term, some of these dev tasks are going to get shorter and shorter and shorter. Creating a new screen is going to take significantly less time in the third iteration compared to the first iteration, just because you've had experience doing it. Come up with a time in hours for how long you think that this is going to take. One thing that I would suggest that you do when you're thinking about the time in hours is to use a strategy that uh, just, just uses your hands. It literally just uses your hands. You don't have seven and a half fingers, so I'm just going to stick to one hand here. You're going to collectively be doing this. You're going to be collectively as a team estimating how long you think it's going to take to do this thing. Using your fingers, I think it's going to take five hours. I think it's going to take three hours. I don't know. Some people do three like this. I do three like this. I think it's going to be trivial. I actually don't think it's going to take any more than 10 minutes to do this. So I'm not going to put any fingers up. This is an opportunity for you to learn about what your team knows about these problems that you're trying to create, that you're trying to solve. You're not trying to create problems. This is an opportunity for you to find out what your team knows. Maybe somebody has done Android development before. Maybe somebody has a much better sense of the classes that you need to create for this user story than you do. 
This is an opportunity for you to say, hey, why do you think this is going to take five hours and I think it's trivial? What haven't I thought of? Or what can I tell you to change what you think about this to, to, to help you realize that it is actually trivial? All that said, if you can't all independently say it's going to take less than seven and a half hours, seven and a half hours, uh, oh gosh. <laughs> If you can't all independently say it's going to take less than seven and a half hours, this isn't one user story. If it's going to take a day, if it's going to take a whole day just to do this one task, that is a user story. It may not be a user story. It may not be a user story in the form of, as a person named X, I want to be able to do Y. It might be a user story that's of the form this is a task that's going to take one day. And in terms of planning out what we're doing, I need it to be a whole day. I need to take a whole day to do this thing. And I'm going to come up with dev tasks for this specific thing. So this might be a more like a developer user story. That's what I'm going to call that, a developer user story. Once you get that done, you've got a list of the developer tasks that you have for this specific user story sum up the total cost of all of the time estimates, and then possibly revise the plan. Make new user stories. Take user stories that you thought you were going to do in iteration zero and move them to another iteration. You don't have enough time to fill up, you don't think? Move features from iteration two down into iteration one. Make changes to your release plan as necessary based on what you've learned about the estimates that your team is coming up with. The tools that you're going to use to do this are Post-it notes. You've got lots of those. Wall, there's four of those around this room. And then you're going to be using a pen to order some of the tasks. You're going to have priorities. So pick up the user story that you think is the highest priority and pick up the user story that doesn't have any dependencies. This is the one that you can just start working on without having built anything yet. Pick up this user story and start working on that task. As you finish solving dependencies, we've estimated all of the tasks for this user story. We can move on to its dependent user stories, the one that requires it to be finished first. So what I'm going to ask you to do is take a look back at the course webpage. I've got those user stories for Notflix. If you want to use those, but I would suggest that you just pick up your own user stories. You have user stories that you created for your projects. Start coming up with dev tasks for those user stories. I'm going to put. This back up. To give you a sense of the steps that you should go through. Brainstorm, estimate, add everything back up. I'm going to give you 10 minutes to do this. So let's just start with one user story. If you can get through one user story, move on to another one. And then we'll all get back together and we'll think about something else. Please go ahead. Oh, uh, sorry. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, one thing that I would suggest that you do is either use the stickies like you've got on the wall, or if you've got your user stories in GitLab already, one user story belongs to one issue. So issue number one is user story number one. If you want to just use GitLab, this is where I would suggest that you start using those checkboxes. So a developer task can be a checkbox. So the syntax for that was uh, make a bullet list. So it's a star and then a space, and then open square bracket, space, close square bracket. And then you get a checklist out of that. So you don't have to use post-it notes in a wall. If you want to use GitLab and just keep it all in GitLab, that's also fine. But uh, that's up to you. Please go ahead. OK, thank you. So things, things seem to be going OK. They seem to be going OK. I've been around to see a bunch of teams, and it looks like we're doing OK with, uh, with everything. There's a couple things that I want to bring up uh, specifically about issues and, um, and GitLab. One is uh, what I would suggest that you do. 
I'm not going to require you to do this, but I'm making the suggestion because it's going to make my life easier if you do this. It will make my life easier, and if I'm happy, you will be happy. Uh, if you're making epics, so this is, let's call this my first epic. This is what my epic is. And I create this new issue. What will be helpful for me is if you create your user stories. So I'm going to make a new issue. This is my first user story. It would be helpful for me if you write something like, this is part of epic number one. When you render this, so when you see this, that turns into a link. That's going to help me know which user stories belong to which epics. That's going to help me see that better. The other thing that I'm suggesting that you do, and this is actually kind of up to you, is uh, dev task one, two hours, dev task two, one hour, something like that. That's one option. And then when you create that, you've got bullet uh, check marks here. And I have to be really honest, it's been a while since I looked at GitLab. I didn't know that there was a tasks right in the issue. I didn't know that was there. If you want to use this, if you want to add tasks in uh, this system this way, that's also fine. However, you as a team to decide to, to do it is up to you. Just make sure that it's done. That's, that's what I'm suggesting. So the main thing that's not really stated anywhere that it would be really helpful for you to do, you're not going to lose points if you don't do it, but it's going to make my life easier, is if you relate your user stories back to the epics by using that number sign format. And then how you do dev tasks in GitLab is kind of up to you as a team to decide, so whichever approach that you want to do. All right, uh, before we move on, um, I just want to stop and make sure that we're all OK, because we've got this thing that's due tomorrow. I want to make sure everybody's good. We don't have any major questions about it. Eleven Mississippi, twelve Mississippi, thirteen Mississippi, fourteen Mississippi, fifteen Mississippi. Okay, good, good, excellent. All right. So I'd like to move on. The part that we're going to be talking about starting now is not really going to be something that you're using yet. You're going to start needing to do this next week when you're starting to work on actually coding. But I want to start getting this out of the way now. I'd like to start talking about this now so you have at least something to work with when you're starting to do coding. Before we do that, I'd like to, uh, oh, you know what? I need to restart this. I made a terrible mistake here. I don't want this to be a team-based thing. I want this to be an individual-based thing. This is a poll. I would like you to tell me a little bit about your experience with Git and version control. So this is for everybody to do independently. This is not a team task. All right. So this is, this is as much for me as anything else. What I'm assessing here is I want to know how much experience you have with version control, and I want to know how much experience you have with Git. And that's going to help me decide kind of how detailed I want to be about telling you about version control and Git. So let's get started with that. So this is just in general. It doesn't necessarily have to be Git. It's just in general. <laughs> OK. All right. That's good. That's kind of consistent with what I'd expect in terms of uh, we don't teach anyone about version control in this university for some reason. If it helps, it doesn't help you. It doesn't help you at all. I'm sorry. Uh, 
we are going to have lab courses starting next year, first year lab courses, and one of the outcomes for the first year lab course is for students to learn about version control software and use Git. So I'm hoping that in the next two or three years, this will move more toward yellow than it will from, from the red. But this is totally fine. This is kind of where I expect you to be in terms of what we're doing in courses at, at this institution. Now this is asking specifically about Git. Okay. All right. Okay. So this is, like I said, this is approximately where I'm expecting, expecting everyone to be. Where that it exists primarily is where I'd expect most people to be. Moderately have used it before on my own projects and can commit and push. So the bulk of, of our, our classmates here have very fairly small amounts of experience with, uh, with Git and version control, and that's, that's totally okay. By the end of this course, you should all be here. You should all be at yellow. You should all be at the point of, I've worked with other devs. You can look beside you to see which devs you're going to be working with. You've all worked with other devs. You've all worked with branches. You've all done merging and pull requests and that sort of thing. That's where I'm expecting you to be by the end of this course. If you are in the yellow part, if you are in this point of, uh, the red part, sorry. I've never used this before. I don't really know anything about version control software. We will spend a little bit of time on this in class. We're, we're not going to spend any time on this in class today. I want to be respectful of your time. We will spend some time in class on this, but if you don't have any experience, I'd suggest that you take a look at some of these. You don't have to look at all of them. This article by Seth Robertson is useful for you to know about later. I would suggest that you don't start with this one. Don't read this until you're in trouble. By in trouble, I mean you've got a Git repository and it's in a state where you, you can't commit to it or you, you're trying to pull from somewhere and you've made a mistake in what you're doing or you push changes that you didn't intend to push in the first place. I'm going to be really honest. I've used Git for a long time, and I still search for this. The choose your own adventure guide on Git. Like That's the terms that I'm using to find this article when I run into trouble with version control. Better explained, these two articles, they're OK. I'd say they're OK to get started. They're reasonable descriptions of what it's doing. The Git tutorial on GitHub itself, this one used to be really good. <laughs> it used to be really good, and then they changed it to something else. It used to be this interactive tutorial, and now it's more just like getting started with, uh, with GitHub and stuff. The quick start is a good way to get started. This is a good way to get started. Yes, this is talking about GitHub, but this all literally just directly applies to GitLab in exactly the same way. You're just changing URLs for the repositories that you're talking about. This, uh, this one, this is me telling you about the stuff that I've done. This is what's going in the lab course. So in the first year, we're going to be expecting students who are taking this course to be able to use Git on the command line. Uh, and this is kind of telling us a little bit about what, uh, you know, initializing a project and stuff. You already have projects. You created these project repositories on GitLab, so you're kind of starting a couple levels above what this is talking about. But I do say a little bit about, you know, what version control is and what Git is in this, uh, in this article. So what I'm going to ask politely is that if you've never, ever used version control before, that you spend at least half an hour reading one of these articles for next week so that we can just get directly into talking about branching strategies. That's where I want to be next week is talking about branching strategies with your team. So deciding how you're going to go about doing development itself. With that, I'm going to skip ahead here 
And I hope that you all have a great weekend. And uh, I will see you next week. Bye, everybody.